This is the video lecture for Lecture 13, Herbs and Spices. Today we're going to switch gears up a little bit and talk a little less about the individual biology of uh, all of the plants we're going to work with and instead we're going to group them together by their relatedness and by uh, common characteristics of where they came from and or uh, the part of the plant they're used from. So we're, we're going to step away from talking about inflorescences and talking about you know whether or not something's an annual or perennial and more talk about where it falls in taxonomy and geography. So uh, as always please make sure you're taking notes on a piece of paper and if you don't have a piece of paper and a pencil pause me right now and go grab it and then otherwise you uh, you should begin with writing down our learning goals for 13.1. First off we're going to describe the uses of secondary plant products we're going to start by saying why plants produce them and then for the whole lecture we're going to be talking about some secondary plant products that people use. Okay, So this learning goal will actually extend all through uh, the, the, the lecture. Then we're going to explain the difference between an herb and a spice and it's, uh, it's going to be one of those grocery store definitions but it has mostly to do with the difference between using leaves of an, uh, of an, uh, of an organism versus using other parts of the organism. And then finally, uh, we're going to describe the four families of herbs, and we're going to give their common name. We're not going to memorize their scientific name because it changes every day. Uh, and also, we're going to talk about the famous members. So that's going to be our first start of uh, focusing on relatedness. All right, secondary plant products. You've already run across these because when we talked about caffeine, we were talking about a secondary product. These are chemicals that are not critical for the plant to stay alive. They're chemicals that help the plant survive in its environment, uh, interacting with other species. So for example, uh, they can act as insecticides. Uh, that's uh, one form of secondary plant product. They can also attract pollinators. Uh, they can be, uh, you know, so that's a scent that's created. So for example, we will talk about lavender uh, and the pretty scent of lavender and lavender oil uh, is pretty clearly a uh, an attractor for its pollinators. Um, but then there's other things. We'll talk about cinnamon and how its bark is antibacterial and things like that. So it's either going to uh, get rid of something that would chew on it, like an insect or an herbivore uh, or uh, maybe a fungus or a bacteria, or it's going to attract some animal to it, like a pollinator or the thing that's going to eat its fruit. Okay. So that's secondary plant products. We've, uh, we're gonna, everything we talk about today is making use of that fact. It's not making use of the calories of the organism. It's making use of something that it's producing uh, to interact with other species. Now when we talk about herbs and we talk about spices, we're going to separate these two. Herbs, um, they, you're usually referring to a leaf. That's your primary thing that you're talking about. Let's call those leaves. So maybe a tea plant would be considered more like an herb if we were in this category. Um, and in fact, there's other herbal teas where they're using other leaves of plants, uh, you know, to, uh, to make these, uh, to make different teas. Uh, a secondary factor is they're generally non-woody, uh, so they tend to be uh, less bush-like and, um, and more just a plant that grows straight out of the ground. An example of this uh, would be like basil. It's a, it's a plant that you can just bend between your fingers and it just kind of folds on itself. It's not even as stiff as celery. That's usually what you see with herbs. However, I do have a picture of a, a key exception. This is the rosemary bush. And I know it kind of looks like some kind of pine tree based on these very slender leaves. You've in fact seen this in many of your neighbor's yards. But the proof that it's not a pine is right here with all these flowers around it. Okay, so whenever you see a flowering bush, you know it's not a conifer. Uh, so this is, uh, this is convergence, this idea of, hey, thin, stiff leaves are a good idea. I think I'll uh, invent them separately from a pine tree. And so that's what uh, this, uh, this rosemary bush did. But the rosemary bush is, as you can see down here, kind of woody. It, it is very bushy. Uh, it won't grow into a tree or anything, but it does get kind of stiff. So it's about the stiffest herb you run across. Now a spice uh, generally comes from other parts of the plant. So you're talking about crushing up uh, seeds, you're talking about crushing up flowers, oftentimes you're uh, digging up um, you're digging up roots or you're shaving off bark or things like this, that's your spice, or you're getting something from a fruit that you're then drying and powdering. So the, the way I would separate herbs and spices from things like fruits is that your herbs and spices tend not to have any sugar in them 
uh, by the end and you use them generally dried. So you take them and while you can use you know fresh parsley for example, you also routinely use dried parsley. Whereas uh, other plant products tend to like even if you dry a fig, it's still got lots of sugar in it and that traps enough moisture that it never truly dries. Okay, so this is our difference between herbs and spices, right? Okay, right here. So that's your difference between herb and a spice. An herb is a leaf and usually a non-woody plant. Uh, spices come from all types of plants and all kinds of parts, just generally not the leaf. Now, we are going to talk about four major families. So in the in the you know taxonomy, we kingdom, phylum, class, order, family. So it's right above genus and species. Now, is that important? No. We're just going to talk about them as groups. So we're going to talk about the mint, parsley, and mustard families. And we're going to recognize right off that they're all more closely related to each other than onions are related to them because they are all dicots. So they're going to be in a grouping called dicot and the onion family is going to be in the monocots. So right there is, is the beginning of talking about the relatedness of these various herbs and spices. Okay. At the end of the lecture, I'll show you a whole bunch of family trees uh, of, in some cases, actual trees. Uh huh. Dad joke. Um, and uh, and we'll see who's more closely related to each other. Out of mint, parsley, and mustard, two of those will be closer to each other, and the third one will be the outlier. But they're all three more closely related than they are to the onion. So that's how we're going to start to phrase things. All right. So let's talk about members of the mint family. Okay, most of these make sense as an herb. You're thinking of rosemary, thyme, oregano, basil. All of these are, are, are very uh, pervasive herbs. You use them a lot in the Mediterranean, but you also use plenty of rosemary and thyme up in, uh, up in England. Uh, thyme is a very important spice up there, and rosemary grows practically everywhere on the planet. Uh, so um, these go all over the place. You also have the mints that give them the names. So spearmint and peppermint are the mints we're talking about primarily that, uh, that, that get people's attention here. But the one standout that I want to talk about is lavender. Let me pause over here. See, a sage is also in this group. I'm not going to make you memorize it, but this is sage. Um, here is your basil. Okay, this is your basil plant, right? Dill is also in this group, but I'm not going to make you memorize that. Okay, these are the ones you're going to memorize in the mint family. And yes, I do mean memorize or have a cheat sheet ready because of course you'll be taking this final online and you can use your notes. Okay, so making a quick layout of the, very, the four families of herb, probably a good idea, but let's talk about lavender. Okay, and let's talk about one of your first screensavers that shows up on your Amazon Fire. When you let it go uh, dormant, you see these humps of purple flowers. And what you're looking at is fields of lavender. It's also common as a window screensaver. Okay, so lavender, which you think of that, you know, lavender, we love to put it in like in, in bath products. You know, you don't put it in a shower product because a shower is a thing you take in the morning to wake up. You put it in a bath product because a bath is a thing that you do to go to sleep. And lavender oil is considered uh, to be a relaxing scent. Okay, and I don't know if it's actually proven to be true, but since we're very psychosomatic creatures, as long as you convince everybody that lavender relaxes them, every time they smell lavender, they will relax. So it really doesn't matter if there's a biochemical cause for the relaxation or just, a, just like a, a psychological effect. Lavender relaxes you. So walk around believing it and it will work. Now let's move on to the parsley family. Okay. Your herbs here are parsley, cilantro. Okay, well, so here's cilantro. There, that's a pretty one. You also have um, cumin uh, and anise, all right? What was anise? I'm gonna go back to the first page here. This right here is star anise. It's where you get a lot of your licorice -y flavors from. Uh, and so this uh, anise is used in a uh, common liquor uh, in, the, in the Middle East. Okay, kind of a Turkish and Persian liquor. Uh, it's also used in, I mean, that, that liquor is what we kind of changed and made something called Jägermeister out of. But it's also where you get your licorice flavors and candies and things like that. That's the natural source of it. We probably use a chemical artificial thing now for candy. But so that's anise. Cumin is, your, is one of your primary spices when you're making chili. Okay, what you think of when you make a pot of chili is not actually chili pepper. It's mostly cumin. Okay, cilantro we love in our Mexican food. And of course, 
parsley uh, shows up a lot in uh, in just as a I don't even know what the flavor of parsley is. It like it modifies other flavors. So nobody tastes parsley and goes, oh yeah, that would be good in things. It's just when you happen to throw it into dishes, it modifies other spices and makes them for some reason taste better. Now, though they are not herbs, oh, did you hear me? I, I made a mistake. I said I said spices. All right, they they modify uh, other herbs, <laughs> right? All right. But in the parsley family, even though they're not herbs, you also have carrot and celery. Okay, they're important enough that I want you to, to remember them as a relationship. So we won't be talking about them as an herb, but later when I talk about relationships, and I talk about who's related to who, you'll need to know carrot and celery are closely related to everybody in the parsley family. Okay, this by the way is called Queen Anne's Lace. It's the top of, fittingly enough, a carrot. It's the flower for a carrot, okay? And then this right here is the flower for celery. Okay. Now, our third family that's also a dicot, remember, because that's the first three families are dicot, is going to be our mustard family. Okay. So that's going to be turnips, radishes, horseradish. Okay, if you haven't eaten these, these are all kind of tough vegetables. They have the consistency of, you know, kind of a root or a potato. Okay, so that makes sense. But also, you get mustard. Now, what did I just say here? I said herbs are normally a leaf. These three are not a leaf, they're a root. So that whole herb thing, the rule of it, is only so-so, okay? It's, it doesn't apply well to the mustard family. Now, uh, what else do, comes along with mustard? Well, cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, all those, uh, cauliflower, all those things came from the mustard plant. So in addition to the herb mustard, you have all of these vegetables that you don't use as herbs, you use them as dishes. Now finally the outlier. Um, it's not officially called the onion family, but I call it the onion family because I think it's dumb to call it anything else because you know it by onions and garlic, which is closely related to an onion. And uh, you may not know much about leeks and shallots. Uh, they're just other onion versions. But uh, chives, you also know about. The thing where we don't really pay attention to the bottom, the onion-shaped part. We pay attention instead to the green uh, stalks on chives, and this happens to be chives. Um, and what I love about this picture is it reminds you that chives, even though they are a monocot, not a dicot, all monocots and dicots are angiosperms. So that means they all have a flower. So uh, chives and onions and garlic, all of them are going to produce flowers, just like you got out of your you know, your onions, uh, I mean, out of your carrots and out of your celery. Everything that I'm talking about today is a flowering plant, okay? So there's flowers on everything, including on chives if you let them grow long enough. Incidentally, chives and scallions actually both come from the same plant. This is just a side note. Chives are when you cut the green part only. Scallions is when you're cutting closer to the base. Uh, down uh, near where the actual bulb is and so you get a much thicker product and it looks more like an onion and less like a leaf okay so there you go and once again onions oh garlic leeks shallots I, mean, I just said that herbs are primarily leaves and here you're working with the root okay so that leaf versus not leaf is a weak characterization all right let's move on to 13.2 Let's explain how the geography of spice, 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 I said, spice growth in the East resulted in exploration of Africa and the Americas, okay, by Europe. Obviously, uh, you know, Africa and America was plenty explored by its own people, uh, but this is from a European history uh, perspective. Then we'll list five of the old world spices that we still use today. There are dozens of spices being used. Uh, in uh, in the Middle East that you don't recognize. Uh, most of you don't because you don't uh, cook that kind of cuisine. Uh, so for example, um, you're not going to recognize a lot of saffron. Okay, you may have heard of it, you may have eaten it occasionally, you know, gotten some rice with, that's white with a little yellow on top, uh, but otherwise you're not very familiar. We'll focus on five spices that you're very familiar with. Uh, then we'll also list three spices that were discovered in the New World Okay, and that it really took over the whole world. There's a, there's one of them that you're gonna be like, oh dang, every culture uses that now. Um, and then we are going to focus on that one species. We're gonna focus on bell peppers, which are also all hot peppers. They're all the same species pretty much, 
Okay, there's various hybridizations of lines, but they can all breed together. And so we're going to find out that, that most peppers, regardless of if they're jalapeno or habanero or chili or whatever you want to say, uh, they're all going to track back to uh, the, the same species origin. All right. Okay. The five major spices that I want to talk about, I want to focus on the fact that they are primarily used in tropical regions. Okay. And the reason they're primarily used in the tropics is we found a human history uh, uh, trend and that's the colder your climate, the less spice you use in your food. Okay, because one of the things that spices do is they are specifically antibacterial. Okay, most of your herbs aren't antibacterial, but most of your spices are. Uh, the exception there is onions. Onions are pretty antibacterial. Uh, but other than that, uh, it's the spices that you need to keep your food from spoiling. And so the warmer and wetter your climate, the more spices you need to use. Okay, and so that's why we focus on them coming from tropical climates or coming from a tropical climate being imported into something more like a desert climate. Okay, so how does this relate to European exploration? Well, anytime people are leaving Europe and making long voyages, first off, they're risking death. Uh, it's not, I mean, other than the Titanic, you don't think of ships sinking very often in modern uh, history uh, unless there's a war. But uh, back in like the 15th and 16th century, so you're talking about 14, you know, 1492, style stuff um, there was a anytime you are going to an unexplored region of the ocean there's an even chance you're not coming back we always hear about the successful ones nobody ever talks about the the expeditions that went off and were never heard from again so these are pretty dangerous trips so why would you do that well money that's why you would do that and so the big money that we're looking for is we're looking for a way to get from Europe to the spice trades in this region, okay, of Asia and the Middle East er, and, and the Far East here, okay, trying to get there, but you don't want to have to travel through all these countries because all these other countries are acting as middlemen on your spices. They're taxing it along the way, they're taking their cut of it, and it's also a long, slow walk, all right? So that, that all results in expense. So Europe had this huge appetite for spices. They didn't have an efficient way to get them from the East to Europe. And they also didn't have a way to get them cheaply because they were the farthest customer that you could get. Okay, so they were paying too much for them. So a lot of exploration of Africa was trying to find a way around on the ocean to get to, you know, your parts of Asia. Okay. Exploration of the Americas also followed the same route. It was attempts to go the backwards way around the globe and into the east. Um, Columbus was by no means the first person to think that the world was round. It was pretty well documented by then. He just thought, A, it was smaller than it was, and B, nobody really you know, had recorded the existence of North America very much. So he was like, hey, if we go this way, I bet you we'll miss all of South America. Thank you, Magellan, for teaching us about that. Uh, we'll miss that and we'll, we'll bypass around and we'll go all the way to Asia. So all of these exploration voyages, Marco Polo was the same, they were all about finding a spice road, okay, so you could bypass the land road, okay? So all of this is coming from these old world spices. Now, the spices we're gonna talk about, cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, ginger, and I don't know why it's lowercase, but black pepper, okay? So when I say pepper here, I'm talking about black peppercorns, like you put in your pepper grinder, okay? So cinnamon is gonna be a bark from a tree, Okay, that's a very large organism. That's one of the first things we've talked about that's actually in a, a perennial plant. Okay. We're also going to get cloves, okay, and peppercorns as a fruit. Okay, so these are the these are going to be a fruit from a plant that we then dry and grind up later to use as a spice. So there's your black pepper. Ginger is going to be a root. Okay. Now, why is ginger called a spice instead of an herb? Well, let's not get too technical about it. Let's just go on with life, okay? It probably has to do with the fact of how strong the flavor is because it is a hot flavor. And so spice also became, you know, if you put cinnamon uh, in things, it eventually becomes hot uh, to your mouth. And so to some degree, that's how spices were defined originally is also by their, their pungency, okay? And so those are your old world spices, okay? 
Now, let's go to New World Spices. Until the Americas uh, were uh, you know, well traveled by Europeans, uh, Europeans didn't have allspice, they didn't have vanilla, but most importantly, they didn't have bell peppers. And so spiciness in food had to come from basically black pepper. If you wanted your food hot, black pepper or some relatives of it were what you had. But we know a lot of people like cooking with other spices. And so now I introduce the bell pepper. Okay, one of the spiciest things on the planet. I know you're like bell peppers, like green peppers or the, the orange or the red. Um, yeah, those guys. They themselves are not spicy. They're sweet. Honestly, they, they, they could, you know, even though they don't per se ripen after you pick them, they definitely could qualify as sweet enough for some people to consider them a fruit, okay? I like eating them for breakfast sometimes. I'll just like pick one up and take a bite straight out of it because it's sweet and not spicy. But the capsicum, you know, which you've heard of capsaicin before, uh, comes from this plant as well. Capsicum anum is the same species that gives rise to chili, jalapeno, paprika, habanero, ghost. All of those are peppers and they all come from the same source. So um, when you like spicy Sichuan Chinese food, it's using chili peppers. Okay, so a lot of tr what we consider traditional Chinese food has been modified by the voyages of European explorers bringing this pepper back with them. Okay, and when you think of doing paprika in, a, in some European cooking, uh, some Eastern European cooking is very invested in like Hungary has a lot of paprika use in their traditional cuisine. Well, it wasn't tradition before the 16, 1700s because they didn't have paprika until later. Okay, so this is one of those secondary plant products and bringing it back uh, where the spicy flavor is the secondary product. Interesting evolutionary note. Um, for most of your spicy peppers, it's not the body of the pepper that's spicy, okay? It's not the fruit itself, it's the seeds inside that are spicy, okay? And why is that relevant? Well, if you're a plant, you want animals to eat your fruit, but you don't want them crunching on the seeds. So one hypothesis for the reason why uh, these peppers have developed that spice is the fact that it convinces small mammals, look, eat the fruit, that's fine, but don't chomp the seeds. You better swallow them whole or you're not going to like it. Okay, don't chew too hard, Mr. You know, deer, or you know, given that these are Central America, we'll say don't chew too hard, Mr. Quantimundi. Yes, they have an animal called a Quantimundi. I'll show you a picture of it later. It looks like a raccoon mixed with a lemur mixed with like a freaking anteater. It's amazing. All right, so that's the capsaicin plant. And I'll tell you one more benefit of capsaicin. It is used to control heart. So heart conditions are often treated with concentrated capsaicin with a pill. So it's one of our natural medicines that we get uh, that helps with heart disease. Now, the last section of this lecture is a whole bunch of relationships and it will look boring to you unless you reference what we talked about earlier in this lecture and others. Okay, I am gonna put things like your vegetables, your fruits, and also these herbs and spices we've just talked about into some family relationships so you can start to see what the evolutionary history of plants, and we're focusing on the flowering plants, looks like. So we're gonna talk about three groups of flowering plants. I've kind of lied to you. I told you that all flowering plants were either monocots or dicots. It's not technically true. There are some, there are some outlier plants called the magnoliids. Magnoliids. So magnolia phyta has a group inside of it that is neither monocot nor dicot. We'll talk about those and which plants we've already talked about that fall into the magnoliid. Next, we'll talk about some close and distant relationships inside the monocots. Okay, and so we'll do some things where we say this pair is closer to each other than that one. Okay, sort of like you and your sibling are closer related than either of you is to your cousin. We'll play that kind of family tree game. We'll play the same game inside of the dicots, and then we'll really drill down into a group inside the dicots called the asterids, which I brought up already when I was talking about coffee. Okay. And so asteroids, we're really going to expand and look at a whole bunch of these herbs and uh, food products that we get from that group inside of dicot.
Okay. So all of these pictures are pulled off of uh, our, our cladograms that were created uh, just from uh, commonly available data, and these can be found on uh, on Wikipedia. So I probably should have put a note down at the bottom, but there's no actual creator from them. It, it was created by an Excel spreadsheet. Okay, it created itself almost. A computer did it. Inside of the angiosperms, so this is phylum Magnoliophyta, all right? This is synonymous with angiosperm. This is all the flowering plants. In there, you have the dicots and the monocots. Okay, don't worry about all these other words you don't uh, you don't know much about. They're just there to uh, to flag you to the fact that there are more groups than I've oversimplified things to. Okay, what I want you to focus on right now is the monocots, the dicots, which are some call times called eudicots. Okay, and the magnoliids. Based on this family tree you can see that the dicots are closer to the monocots and the monocots are closer to the dicots than either of them is to the magnoliid. And you might say, well, Dr. Lockamy, there's one species in between each of them. See, I got one space, two space, three. So how can you say they're closer? I'm putting air quotes on closer. Well, when you're talking about relationships, you don't look left, you know, top to bottom or left to right. What you do is you count branch points in between. And really, it's less about counting one, two, three, and it's about how far back do you go towards the common ancestor of all angiosperms before you reconnect. So here's what I mean. If you're looking at the dicots and you start tracing their family tree back, you get to a point where the dicots and the monocots diverged from a common point. Okay, so this would be like your grandmother. So if this is you, this is your sister, your parents are right here, your grandmother's back here, and that's maybe like your aunt or uncle. Okay, see what I'm talking about? So we had to track back to a grandparent. But to link up with this group, you had to go all the way back to your great-grandparent, one generation further back, to link up with all of the magnolias. So that's why we say the dicots and the monocots are closely related uh, relative to the magnolias, which are the distant relative. Okay. Now, who goes in magnoliids? Remember that cinnamon, nutmeg, and pepper we talked about? Okay, so three of your old world spices that were very important fall into that magnoliid group. Okay, so you might want to go back into some of these groups and say where they land. Okay, now, who's going to be in the monocots? We're going to have onion, ginger, vanilla, and some crops. So let's spread out the monocots now. Inside the monocots, okay, you have ginger of course, and one of Ginger's closest relatives that we have talked about is the group called Poales. And uh, about five lectures back, we talked about grass and corn being in the family of Poales. Okay, and so on this tree, if we're talking about inside the monocots, I want you to know that Ginger and corn or grass are closely related to each other. And since we know there's things like wheat and barley and things like that, all of those are grasses, you could lump all of that into this relationship. But I'll just talk about corn, grass, and ginger as closely related. Now, who's less related to them? Well, ginger, that was an old world spice. We also have vanilla, which is a new world spice, and we have onions. Onions and vanilla are closely related to each other, even though we call one of them a spice and one of them an herb. It's starting to point out that spice versus herb is really more about a human definition of how we use them and far less about their relationship to each other. Okay, so we did all flowering plants and we said monocots and dicots are closer to each other than these outliers called magnoliids. Okay, then we said in the monocots, you know, ginger and corn slash grass were closer to each other than either were to the onions and vanilla. Now remember, all of these guys are closer to each other than they are to, say, for example, cinnamon and nutmeg. Okay, so every time you're talking about who is more closely related to who, you, you have to say, well, what level are we talking about? Are we comparing these three things to each other? Or are we comparing them to a whole extra group? Okay, now if we're going into the dicots, we can see that you have a split. You have the asterids containing a lot of things. And then you have these things called fabids and malvids over here in the rosids. So asterids and rosids are a big split inside of the dicots. Okay. And the rosids 
They're coming from things like the rose, but also things like the apple tree and the green bean. I just kind of threw that one in there to show you how diverse two, two things can be but still be related. You don't think of an apple and a green bean being related at all except that they're plants that we eat. But as far as their relationship, their evolutionary relationship, they're actually quite close. Remember that mustard family we talked about? It happens to fall in the roses as, as well. It's going to fall in there, but so is citrus. All of the citrus trees are going to fall in there as close relatives to mustard. So now you're starting to see the relationships of various foods that you don't think of as having any comparison to each other. You wouldn't think an orange has much to do with broccoli, but from, a, from an evolutionary history standpoint, it does. It has quite a bit to do. Whereas down in the asteroids, you've got a whole bunch of different things. I'm not going to talk about these things right now. I'm going to talk about them on this tree. Okay, So I'm going to expand out the asteroids so I don't have to... Uh, whoops. Okay, here's the relationships inside the asteroids. We talked about tea and coffee earlier being members of the asteroids. And a uh, previous lecture, I talked about how uh, coffee was closer to things like sunflowers than tea was. Okay, well, let's spread this out and show why. Coffee, mint, and all your peppers are going to fall in this small group of the asteroids called the Lamiids. Now, you don't have to remember the word Lamiid. You do have to remember the word asteroid. But these small, these smaller words, uh, they're they're just you know they change over time. There's no sense in you remembering them. But you just notice that on their family tree, coffee, mint, and your peppers. Your, uh, and by peppers, I'm talking about the hot peppers, not black pepper. We're talking about bell pepper. We're talking about habanero. Coffee, the whole mint family, and all of your peppers, okay, all fall into one group. And so we would say they're all closely related to each other and more closely related to each other than they are to parsley and the sunflower. You know, meanwhile, if we're looking at parsley and the sunflower, they're closer to each other because they track back to a common point here. Okay, long before they would track back to a common point with this coffee, mint, and peppers. Okay, these guys come to a common point here. Okay, they don't come to their common point with sunflower and parsley until back here. So that's more generations back. Okay, now uh, if you're going to make an even wider comparison, you'll say, well, how does tea fit in this group? Well, you would say sunflower, parsley, coffee, mint, peppers, they're all more closely related to each other in this larger group called the U asteroids than they are to T. T is kind of the outlier inside the asteroids. Okay? So in every family you have closer and broader relationships and so no matter what scale we're talking about, if we're talking about inside one little group of the dicots of the angiosperms or if we're zooming all the way out to the angiosperm group itself we can still draw relationships of who is more closely related to whom. Okay, so big relationships like uh, onions, ginger, vanilla being closely related to all the crap that's in the dicots, which is most everything in this lecture. Okay, or whether we're talking about how coffee, mint, and peppers are all closer related to each other once we've zoomed inside the asteroids. Okay, so that's the learning goal is to be able to describe these relationships. Maybe what you want to be able to do is have this tree printed out and the tree itself doesn't give you the whole answer. What the tree does is give you the ability to craft your answer. You know, it gives you the ability to look at this picture and say, oh, based on this picture, these are the relationships.